Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Your co-hosts, Jamie Albright and Sarah Rosette, couldn't be more different. In fact, they're a study in contrasts. However, despite all of their differences, they agree that sharing what they wish they'd known, both the good and the bad, is the key to moving forward. Let's get to the show. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Them podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the podcast, we have Andrea Pearson. Yeah, we do. It was a great interview. Uh, We talked about, um, you know, instead of your career, like that skyrocketing sort of thing that I think we all think is going to happen. The reality is, yeah, the reality is it's, it's incremental Mm -hmm. growth in incremental steps, you know, to get Mm -hmm. where you want to go. And sometimes there's a little bit of a setback and then you move forward uh, in big leaps and bounds. And then you talk about working with your husband and And working when you have little kids. Yeah. Yeah. And when there's been, you know, kind of some setbacks just personally and stuff. Um, So it was a great interview. I love Andrea. Yeah. 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 I think it'll be really good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think people will like it and get a lot out of it. So, yeah. 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 So I'm going to like, just throw this to you because um, as far as what you've done this week, you know, there's this that phrase, some days you get the bear, some day the bear gets you. <laughs> well, the bear has chewed my behind this week. So um, uh-huh. we've had some family stuff and I, I did write at the beginning of the week, but uh, I had to leave town and yeah. um, handle some stuff. So anyway, tell us what you've been doing. Well, I was going to say that kind of goes with the theme of this show. Because yeah, yeah. like you, sometimes you just make great progress and other yeah. times it's more of a waiting game. So yeah, that's exactly. totally cool. So um, so for me, I had like Tuesday, I had the book come out. Mm-hmm. So that was book five in the High Society series and it went really yes. well. And so that great. was good. Uh-huh. And um, I don't keep track of rank very much. Uh-huh. Um, I'm more interested in the sales since yeah. I'm wide. So, but the sales did good and That's great. I didn't, because it's a book five, I didn't launch like a, I didn't do a huge launch. I did like even right. my newsletter, boost a post or two and you know, that was about it. So, and then I did some low budget Amazon ads. Mm-hmm. So like for money invested in return, it's been excellent. And oh, that's great. Yeah. So, and happy readers. They're excited. Of course, I got the email like, oh, I'm so looking forward to the next one. I can't, I can't believe I have to wait. And I'm like, but it's already on pre-order. So, you know, it's coming. Exactly. (laughs) And you just read this one. I know. I know. I'm a people pleaser though. So it's like, I want to make everybody happy. So, Yeah. yeah. So, but anyway, at least that one's done and in the process of being completed. So that's good. So I did that. And then I, when we logged in, Jamie and I are on Zoom, and I I said, said, welcome to my blanket fort because I'm recording the audio book for how to write a series. And um, I learned that it's best to have, you know, like to be in it, like in a closet if you can, but I don't really have a way to set up in a closet. So I've just covered I'm covered in blankets, basically. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. I'll take a screenshot. Is that an I have umbrella? an umbrella propping things up. Yep. Oh, so that hilarious. it doesn't like fall on me. And, uh-huh. um, so I've actually recorded, um, I, what I, my tip is start recording and I went all the way to the end. It's only 20,000 words. So mm-hmm. I was able to get through like the first yeah. draft essentially. Uh-huh. And then I just went back and re-recorded the introduction in the first mm-hmm. chapter because I sound so stilted it's yeah, like, and yeah. I'm nervous, you know, in the yeah. beginning, afraid I'm going to say something wrong. So. Right. But I mean, I'm going to have somebody else help me edit it. So I'm taking oh, out right. my, yeah. my mistakes when I have to start over. I'm going to pull those out and then I have somebody else make it all perfect. You know, all the sound levels and stuff. So that's awesome. Yeah. So if anyone else wants to do this, it's, not that hard, but I don't know that I would do it for fiction. No. Because I think it would be really hard to do different characters. And yeah. I think that would be a challenge. Okay. <laughs> so Anything that's, else? That's all I've had going on. Um, no. I'm 
let's see. I downloaded a couple of nonfiction books that I heard about on a podcast. One is called um, Fanocracy, and it's about fans and how they interact. Yeah. And it's really interesting. Yeah. And some of it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And then some of it, I think, hmm, Jamie would love this. This is for an extrovert. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if it um, involves holding hands and skipping in the sun, then yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll put a link to that in the notes. Yeah, do, but, um, do. Yeah, do. So, well, so that is about all we've got going on. We've, yeah. Um, I'm boring this week for sure. That's so, okay. I know. Let's listen to Andrea. She's got lots of good things to say. Yes. Let's do it. Today, we're really excited to have Andrea Pearson with us. Hi, Andrea. Hi. 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 So um, I'm going to read a quick bio, and then we'll jump right into the questions. Um, Andrea Pearson is an avid reader and outdoor enthusiast who plays several instruments, not including the banjo, and loves putting together musical arrangements. Andrea is the author of many full-length novels and several novellas. Writing is the chocolate of her life. It is, in fact, the only thing she ever craves. And mm. I totally agree with that. That's so cool. I love that bio. Yeah, so, I've still never had a chocolate craving, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. It's just not my thing. I like, I like salty things. I'm not a oh, big yes. person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like that's I like a little right sweet there. salty, but not, yeah. Yeah. Payday bars. They're my downfall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll take oh. all the chocolate all the time. The yeah. darker the better. <laughs> so Andrea, tell us what genres you write in and how did you get into writing? Um, so my main thing is fantasy and I write fantasy for kids all the way up through adults oh. um, and urban fantasy, epic fantasy, mostly urban fantasy. Um, I do have um, illustrated kids books that are just general, like about foxes, dragons, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever my kids wanted. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I also do ro- uh, Western romance, though I haven't done that much in the last couple of years. Um, and what got me into writing, um, how, I don't know, I was going through a really tough time in college. And one of my only um, outlets was writing. I absolutely fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so you fast forward a few years and, you know, cause I was, I was like most college students, I was like, I'm going to be a writer. And I didn't really do anything with it. Right. Um, but uh, fast forward a few years and I was in, I was taking the maximum number of credits allowed at my university and I was working three jobs, including a full-time one. And I was absolutely stressed and got, you know, went through a breakup and just really, really stressed. And I started reading a super popular book at that time. And I knew, I just knew I could do better. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I wrote the key of cleaning. That's my first book in six weeks. And then, um, I took, it took about a year and a half to edit it. And I ended up, I found an agent. Um, he got me publishers, you know, got me contracts with different publishers. He had a couple of big movie studios that were doing, they were auctioning rights. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a bunch of popular authors, uh, read my book and they were ready to offer blurbs. Of course, you know, while this was all going on, I was like, Oh my gosh, you got who? And mm-hmm. now as, as a marketing person, I look back and I was like, that would have been so stupid because yeah. one of them was a thriller author. One of them was a, a feel good self-help author. Um, and then another one was, um, a, um, a finance author. And I'm really? like, they have nothing to do with my, my, my writing, you know, yeah. nothing, but you know, they were going to, they were going to blurb my book for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I ended up turning down a contract with one of the big six and it really upset my agent. But at that point, I mean, I'd been a paralegal and I was like, um, this contract is asinine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like this is absolutely ridiculous. I will, I will not sign something like this. And I had no idea that that contract was standard. It was what everybody was signing. And I just, I was a paralegal. I hadn't followed the publishing world. I had no idea that people gave away everything mm-hmm. and it made my agent really mad. Um, I ended up signing with a small press local publisher and anyway, so I signed with them and then a year later when nothing happened, I left them to self publish and mm-hmm. that's how I got into publishing. You asked how I got into writing. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's all. Yeah. You got into writing when you, because you just love to write. Yeah. And it yeah. was an outlet for you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, so what do you think was your first big success? Um, you know, honestly, I haven't had a first big success. I've just had lots of little successes that have, cl- have built up over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, my best selling series is to, is still my mosaic chronicles, but I mean, just, just things gradually snowballed, you know, for me. And so I can't say, Oh my gosh, 
look at that book. It made me a million dollars, you know, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I mean, things just gradually built up and then, you know, into success, mm-hmm. which I think it happens a lot with a lot of authors. Some authors, they hit it big really fast and, mm-hmm. and they can replicate it. And sometimes they can't replicate it, but right. you know, I kind of feel like I've had to fight tooth and nail for my success mm-hmm. um, because I, you know, I started off in the wrong genres and I don't know, I think we get into that later, but <laughs> <laughs> well, do you, was there a certain point where like you had like a certain number of books out and you were like, Oh, this is so much easier now, or maybe number of series or something like that, that you were like, Oh, I can relax a little bit now. I don't know if we ever relax. But. Uh, I don't think we ever relax. <laughs> I was like to my husband, I was like, I'm, I'm kind of happy with the money I'm making. And he was like, but we can be doing more. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I know. <laughs> um, uh, okay. So with my first series, I started making, um, like, like mid, mid thousand, mid thousand, is that a word? Like $500. <laughs> and I thought mm-hmm. that was awesome. And that would happen yeah. after I had four or three books out in my main, in my first series. Mm-hmm. And then when I started into the, into the four, you know, good four figures a month, it was, probably around book four in my next series. So I had six book at, books out in one series and then four books out in the other one. But that second series, Mosaic Chronicles, has just really hit the market decently. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, you know, um, yeah, it was, it was like, okay, what you're saying was like advertising was easy with it. I would advertise and people would download, you know? So mm-hmm. that was pretty much what it was. Yeah. And did you, did, did you find you were downloading, I mean, we'll probably talk about this later, but did we downloading the first book in that series because it was such a popular series that you could just do the first book or did you, did you advertise all of those books? Um, I only ever advertised the first book. I mean, I tried advertising later books, but it was, it was kind of a, um, it was a waste of money. I got mm-hmm. a couple of reviews where people were like, well, I downloaded this and I had no idea what was going on. And so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, if it's going to end up in reviews, I'm just going to advertise the first book. So I advertised the first book, the first box set. And, um, and that's pretty much what I stick to. That's good. Yeah. So uh, tell us what you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started. <laughs> uh, you guys have like hard questions to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, how do I answer that? And I mean, I, I knew what the answer would be, but how to <clears throat> express it, you know? Yeah. Um, basically, it was to trust myself. Um, yeah. I never took any creative writing classes. I had no idea what I was doing, but so I was incredibly insecure about my ability to write creatively. Um, but honestly, like I devoured books growing up and I've been a huge movie watcher and I understood the basics of storytelling and, um, how I understood pacing without having to study it. And it took me a long time to go, you know what? I actually know craft. I know how to do this. And so it was, it was just understand or just to recognize that, you know, storytelling doesn't always have to be formally studied to mm-hmm. be good at it. Right. And that, it, that held me back quite a bit, honestly. Like I really second guessed myself in the early days, like, do I even know what I'm doing? <laughs> yes. yeah. Me too. Me too. Because yeah, I- this comes up again and again with on the podcast. Um, so many people say, you know, they just um, wish that they had trusted themselves and mm-hmm. it's really hard for us to do that. It takes a long <laughs> time to figure out how to do it. It does. <laughs> and, and the thing about story is like, I've, I don't think I ever explained to anyone how story worked before I yeah. started writing, but you're right. There's just something about, a story like you if you know how to tell a story or you know the elements of the story you know how to build up I mean for me it's verbally you know I'm always telling stories and I usually have two or three I tell everybody but okay. you know I know when the build up is I know when the payoff is and stuff mm-hmm. and so um but that just comes from either watching movies or reading a lot and you know, growing up around other story, good storytellers, you know, yeah. just verbal, I mean, just listening to them tell good stories. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And even reading bad stuff and watching bad stuff, you're mm-hmm. like, Oh, that that's wrong. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what about marketing? What do you wish you had known about marketing? <laughs> oh, this one I had fun with. <laughs> <laughs> Got a long list for us. <laughs> um, no, it's more of a, this is my pet peeve. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Let us have it. Okay. So the stupid, stupid advice that people used to give is absolutely incorrect. And I see this still, Mm -hmm. um, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. You'll probably never figure out what worked, but keep doing all of it anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you guys, did you ever hear that either of you? Not really, but 
but I've heard other people say it like yeah. kind of the same thing. Yeah. Oh, you can never really know what works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can. Yeah, yeah you but- can. I call BS. <laughs> yeah. I used to hear like- publishers say that all the time that like, yeah. they would just throw all the books out and whichever sold those the ones they would stay with. Yeah. And I think that was a lot of their marketing tactics too. Yeah. It's just like try everything and who knows what works and we'll just pick a couple and keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, people would call, called it like the, the shotgun, you know, cause mm-hmm. shotgun has it, it like, it doesn't have bullets as full shot. And so they mm-hmm. just go all over. And I'm like, that's not, I mean, it's some of the worst adv- advice out there because I mean, back in the day, that is the way it was, especially for traditional publishing when advertising, you wouldn't see effects from it for months, mm-hmm. you know, and your advertising money wouldn't come back for months. And so they had to think long-term and they had to do, they had to take a long time to do things because they wouldn't see results for a long time. And that's not the mm-hmm. way it is now though. Mm-hmm. I mean, and especially back in the past when there weren't a lot of avenues to pursue when it came to marketing, you would just, you had to do everything because mm-hmm. you never knew what was working. Right. Um, and unfortunately it really is still being given today. I mean, I mean, I still see people say, Hey, just do, do whatever you can and see what sticks. And I'm like, that's mm-hmm. such a waste of time and, and money. money. Yeah. And so I'm always like, pick one thing you enjoy and focus on it until you master it. And you'll be a lot more successful that way. Like I've, I still have not mastered book bub ads, but I'm really good at Facebook ads. And I'm like, you know what? There's no need for me to master book bub ads as well. If I'm doing fine with Facebook ads, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. So very true. Yeah. Very good advice. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your career, um, your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be true or false? <laughs> I had no assumptions. <laughs> I was floating along. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just that no. you could write a better book than that popular book that you read. I mean, <laughs> that was my assumption. Yeah. I was right too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm humble. <laughs> um, okay, well, you're still so, writing, so you must have done something yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> that, that author made more money than I did yeah, on that book than I did on mine. But <laughs> um, Okay, so I assumed that if my books weren't successful in the first two years, that I would stop self-publishing. Mm. Um, because I left my publisher and my husband and I were like, well, let's give self-publishing a shot for two years. And if it's not successful, we can try publishing again. Um, but Within two years, I still hadn't had a breakout, but I was making enough money a month, each month to know I would never sign with a publisher. Um, And I had lots of opportunities. I mean, I made friends with authors at my former publisher and they'd gone on to sign with publishers who had expressed interest in my books. They're like, hey, if so and so, you know, if she ever decides to go with a publisher, we would like to sign her. Um, But I watched my author friends closely. I was like, let's see, let's longevity. Let's see what happens over the years. And I'm a patient person when it comes to that. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to watch and see what happens. And all of them either made the same as I did as a traditional published author, or they made less. And the vast majority of them made less. And I'm, I'm a money person. Like Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I love writing and I do it as a way to, you know, to make myself happy. I will continue doing it even if I'm not making money, but I'm going to make the best financial decision for myself possible. And if my author friends are traditionally published and their books are getting downloaded as much as mine are, mm-hmm. then there's something going on. I'm not going to sign with that publisher because I'm going to be giving all of my royalties to them basically, you know, right, right. and I, there was no way I was willing to give up my rights for the same success or less. So even though I wasn't a huge author, by the end of the two years, I never I knew I would never sign with a publisher. And so, I mean, my assumption was that I would eventually sign with a publisher again. But after I, I had a taste and I learned, I mean, marketing is something that authors have to do anyway. And I was like, if I'm going to be doing the marketing, if I'm going to be doing the work, I might as well be getting paid for it. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and and don't we, need, you don't need that validation. Like our validation comes from the readers. And, yep. uh, but I guess, I mean, it really does depend on your goals and yeah. I don't want to poo poo on anyone's dream of being oh, no, no, no. a publisher Poo-poo all the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or well, I, but, yeah. I was just going to say too, that like, if you go with a traditional publisher, you're not only giving up those royalties that you can make right now, but mm-hmm. the way the contracts are, like you were saying, you're giving up pretty much indefinitely. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. you're, the chances of getting your rights back are just pretty small and they want all the rights. And so like, I w- I did a traditional deal in several, and now that I'm indie, I'm like I'm not giving up my copyright anymore. I'm just mm-hmm. not going to do it because yeah. you know it's just not worth it. So yeah, I mean, I there's know. certain situations where I would be con- willing to consider like foreign rights. You know, if there's like yes. a publisher mm-hmm. in 
Germany or France or Spain that was like, hey, we want to publish your books. I'm not going to be translating my books anytime soon. And so mm-hmm. they would cover the cost, right? So it would be worth it, but not, nothing for the like the English speaking market. No, yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Um, okay. So (laughs) I was talking to my husband about this earlier. We accidentally spent about $1,500 on Facebook and Amazon ads that we hadn't budgeted for. And it was in one day. (laughs) I forgot. I was running a huge promotion. We budgeted the money for it and I forgot to turn the ad off after that. And then Amazon, you know how, when you publish, you put ads up on Amazon, sometimes they don't go. Mm -hmm. We had an ad up and my husband, it was originally we set the budget for like a thousand dollars a day because we we were like, well, if it goes crazy, then we've got the money to cover it. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't go crazy, then it's not no harm, no foul, Mm -hmm. but we just come out of a big promotion. And so the budget had already been spent. Um, so we were both like, Oh, that was like one of the most awkward and horrible conversations. My husband was like, uh, honey. And I was like, uh, honey. (laughs) So, um, the royalties ended up being really good. So we ended up making all of that back, but it was still, it was like, we're both savers seeing that money go like $1 hurts, you know, and so $1,500 accidentally spent was very painful. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you had to wait two months to get that money back. You know, that's the hard thing too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I, we, I've done that with a, well, actually some Amazon ads that I thought were off got turned back on. Uh, (laughs) I don't think I did it, but I might have, and it wasn't that much, but it was, you know, it was a couple of hundred dollars and I was like, Oh, well, okay. That's interesting. They were, but sort of like you, they did, they did turn a profit. And then I'm like, well, I guess I'll leave them on because (laughs) (laughs) who knew? Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's funny. So by comparison then, have you ever done something she thought this is a home run and then it turned out to be a dud? Um, pretty much all of my advertising ventures in the early days. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Google ads, great. I'm going to spend a thousand dollars and it's going to make me a billion. It didn't do anything. And then Goodreads again, like $750 on Goodreads ads and man alive. I got to be one of the early authors to say, don't do it. It doesn't work. So you're um, and then, you're talking about the ones at the top and then kind of over on the side with Goodreads? Um, Goodreads. I don't know. This was back in 2011. Oh, okay. So okay. I don't, and I don't use Goodreads. So I have no idea where okay. the ads even went. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just sending them money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did that too. I did that too. You do? <laughs> yeah. Same result. <laughs> um, and then honestly, like, um, I don't, I, I put a lot of money to really, really random websites. You know, those little ones that nobody talks about. I was like, I was willing to, to give them the shot. And that's not exactly something that I regret because, you know, I, I tested and I, and Mm -hmm. I eliminated them, but, um, some of them were based on recommendations by other authors and they were very expensive and nothing happened for me, you know? And, and I mean, when, when I, like the advice I would give for that is do things one at a time, test individually, don't test all at once because you lose more money that way. And then sometimes you can't even tell what worked and what didn't work. Right. Yeah, and we're not this. We're not about the spaghetti on the wall. We want to know what's working, what's not working. <laughs> That's right. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you about was download bonuses. Yeah, because you talked about that a lot on the podcast that you're on, the Six Figure Author Podcast, which Jamie and I both listen to and really enjoy. Mm-hmm. So, um, can you just give us a little um, kind of summary of like what a download bonus is, in case somebody doesn't know, and then like how you use them? Because I think it's really interesting and it's a marketing tactic that I don't think a lot of people are using. I'm not using it because I haven't tried it. You're not using it because you haven't tried it? <laughs> I, 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 I'm a reluctant adopter of most things. It takes me forever to try yeah, anything. <laughs> me too. I mean, I kind of reached the point where everything had been tried. I mean, there's there's not a lot of fresh stuff sometimes in the indie market. And so I started listening to podcasts um, by business owners who weren't affiliated in any way with author stuff and download bonuses one of, was one of the ideas I got. Um, there'll be these, these authors, they're not authors, they're public speakers and they publish one book every 10 years and they mm-hmm. publish one book and they offer like audio books and merchandise and swag and all sorts of stuff to people who down, who, who buy that book. And I was like, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to print things and not going to mail things, but I can apply that to, 
um, publishing a book or running a promotion. And so if I have something that I really want to gain a lot of movement on or get a lot of traction on, I will sit down and brainstorm things that I as a reader would like to get, or I ask my readers and the answers are usually things like stories that I write, um, books by other authors, um, coloring pages from my stories, you know, turning my book covers into coloring pages, uh, mm -hmm. word searches, maps, illustrations, all sorts of just random little things that, you know, people um, enjoy. I mean, even maps for like romance towns. If you write romance books, you can mm -hmm. say, this is where the post office is mm -hmm. and this is where the bank is, that kind of stuff. I love that personally. Right. Um, house plans. Like I love house plans. And so putting together house plans of care of where my characters live or things like that. Um, and then I usually, I will say it's a limited deal. I'll say, if you download the book within this period of time, send your proof of purchase to this email account, and then you'll get your download bonuses. And what I do is on that email account, I have it set up where it's a link. Um, and I generally put all of the download bonuses into one box set just because that's so much easier. They can download one thing and then they have access to everything. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing illustrations, I'll offer it as a PDF and I link to a secret blog page for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and just like a random blog page, nobody would ever be able to guess. And then I'll put all the illustrations, all the artwork there, you know, word search, things like that on that blog page. Mm -hmm. Um, and I use Zapier. If you guys know what Zapier is, they automate things. And so when somebody sends proof of purchase to my, my dummy Gmail account, Zapier automatically responds to them, giving them the link to download the book or oh, the wow. box set. And then the link to the word, you know, the blog site where the illustrations and such are. So that's so smart because you're not physically clicking emails and attaching stuff and mailing it. You're just, it's all done. Which I is did that the first time. <laughs> And learn. I learned <laughs> that was something you wished you knew. <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> Zapier didn't exist back then though. So, yeah. so, That's great, though. so when you're talking about the things you write, are you writing like second epilogues? Are you writing short stories? Are you writing novellas? I mean, I'm, I'm yes. Just, yeah, all of that. Yes, to all of that. <laughs> it's just whatever I feel like writing. Like I've done epilogues, I've done prologues, I've done side stories, I've done um, novellas, I've done short stories. Like um, in one of my series, the main character has to kill immortal beings, and she's the only person who can kill them, and they can only and they can kill each other. And it's like a specific process they have to do to kill each other, and it's this whole like thing. And you never find out in the main series what it is they go through to kill each other. And so I did a short story where they, you know somebody, the main character was getting attacked while she was unconscious and her, she had a friend there protecting her and one of the good hounds, whatever. And he had to kill one of them that came. And so my readers love that. They're like, so that's how it's done. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Yeah. That so is, is it cool. cumulative? Like for like, you do a couple of things for book one and then book two, you do more. And then like, if they get the whole series or do you do a bunch of things for one book? It I sounds usually like do, you do a lot. <laughs> um, I usually do a bunch of things for one book. I try to make it so that even if people who've downloaded the book already and I want to do a promotion, I want them to download again, just mm -hmm. on a different retailer. I give them enough to make it worth their money. Mm -hmm. And I only do, I probably do one event once a year. So I don't do it for every single book just because it is, it's tiring and it's a lot of fun too, just because mm -hmm. the feedback's a lot of fun and gathering the stuff is fun. And I love artwork and that's fun, mm -hmm. but I need to get back to writing. So yeah. I don't, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't like big book launches. And so I generally do it at, on a first in the series or the last book in the series, or if I'm running a big promotion. Very good. Very good. So tell us about writing um, and in multiple genres and dealing with family because, or just <laughs> writing in general and dealing with family, because it sounds like you, you're pretty prolific and you, you're constantly putting stuff out or, even if for these debt bonus downloads and stuff, but you've got little kids. Like you just had a baby not too long ago, right? He's, he's 16 months old, but it feels like it was not. Yeah. Uh, he's had health problems. That's not too, very long though, ago. So. Yes. <laughs> well, that's true. He, he, he did have health problems and you were sort of quarantined in oh, the yes. house. Before we before went coronavirus, yes. <laughs> you got I, we were double whammy. quarantined for six months. <laughs> I was oh like, this is, this is, this is ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so anyway, tell us how, how you juggle all that. Um, very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't neglect my children, but I, re I expect them and I raise them to be independent. So mm -hmm. I don't entertain them all day long. And so 
by the time they're old enough, I mean, I gradually, as they get older, you know, my babies go, you know, they want to be independent. They go through a phase mm-hmm. where they're like, I don't want you to feed me. I want to feed myself. Mm-hmm. And so I just encourage that um, when it comes to playing, if they're like, I'm bored, I'm like, good, you can do some chores. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. so I just, I, I encourage them to entertain themselves and they played with each other really, really well. Um, it's still very difficult. You know, I mean, in the past I will, <clears throat> I'll have babysitters come over and, you know, for like two times a week for a couple of hours. And it's usually like a neighborhood girl, like an 11 year old. She only charges $5 an hour. I mean, I live in baby land and so mm-hmm. people have to charge less cause there's so many, mm-hmm. there's a lot of demand, you know, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so the parents are like, I'll just go find somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so $5 an hour, that's pretty common here. And I just sit in my room or in my office and write while they play with the kids. So I'm there, you know, for in case of emergencies, but I don't get interrupted every five minutes. And that honestly okay. is the biggest issue. Mm-hmm. Um, what else was your, what other parts were your question? What well, other just, parts were your question? <laughs> <laughs> just uh, because you're juggling multiple genres and then you're juggling family too. I mean, how do you schedule all that? And I mean, do you write uh, not only multiple genres, you, you have multiple age groups that you're writing <laughs> to. Like, how do you schedule all that? And do you write multiple series at once or? No, I do. I focus on one series at a time and I usually generally don't focus my promotional efforts on except what I'm currently writing. So if I'm currently writing adult fantasy, I don't advertise my kids fantasy unless it's a passive advertisement that does not take a lot of time to set up. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to do regular promotions on my backlist. I don't write more than one genre at a time and I don't focus on more than one pen name at a time. Um, if I, like I have Western romance under a different pen name, when I switch back to that, which I plan to eventually, I will put my fantasy stuff on hold probably for six months to a year. Mm -hmm. And I plan to write and hopefully have something to release during that time. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I'll be able to focus on romance, but I don't jump very quickly and very easily between things. So I've never been a genre or a, or a series hopper. I just Mm -hmm. generally focus on what I'm doing. And then when it comes to scheduling, cause what we, I mean, we homeschool our kids, um, before it was the cool thing to do yeah. <laughs> or the required thing. I was to do. Saying, yeah. <laughs> the necessary thing to do. Yeah. 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 Um, so what I usually do is I get home, I do homeschool first because that's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And um, I usually have that done before the baby goes down for his nap. And then when he goes down for his nap, I usually have three hours um, before my husband comes at home where I work on marketing and business, basically everything business. And mm-hmm. If I'm currently working on a book, I will focus on that 100% during that time and I won't do anything else. If I'm not working on a book, I put writing on the back burner and I work on marketing and all those projects. Um, I'm very much a project person. I've never been good at writing every single day. It's too hard for me to switch back and forth between things to do that. Right. And so I focus on, I tackle like writing my whole automation sequence and to, before I even get back to writing again. Okay. Yeah. Very good. That's, that's really smart. Yeah, that's yeah. very smart. Very smart. Yeah. And so your automation seri- sequence, do you do that for every book or do you just do it like first in series or uh, last in series or something? Um, when I first started out, I did it for the series, but now I've got too many series. I don't know how they found me generally if they mm-hmm. sign up through my newsletter, my website. Mm-hmm. So my automation sequence is geared to fantasy readers. And mm-hmm. then I offer a box set of exclusive stories that has something from all of my main stories, my main series in it. Mm-hmm. So a little side story from everything, just mm-hmm. so that anybody who finds me will find something that they enjoy in there. Um, and I do that for my, my romance and my fantasy. And I have separate lists, separate automation sequence, separate, mm-hmm. separate um, bonuses for both. That's great. That, that, um, I don't know if you, if this is what it is, but first in series starter box set, uh, that people, uh, people with a lot of, uh, series do. I think that's so smart. I mm-hmm. wish I had enough series to do that. I've got one and one, one and a half. It's one, one, <laughs> one, in a, and, in a beginning. one and one big, one book. Yeah. But I just think that's a very, you know, I mean, or like you're saying short stories or novellas or something that kind of encompasses everything. So they can find what they're looking for and liking. I love that. That's so smart. Yeah. And one thing with that box set, I I make sure that the vast majority of it is not available on Amazon because Mm -hmm. if it is, a lot of people are willing to buy everything you write and they Mm -hmm. would rather not be on a newsletter list. Mm -hmm. And so they'll just buy it instead. Um, And some of my best readers, they waited until the very end and they're like, "Ugh, I really can't get this anywhere else. (laughs) And then they join my newsletter list and they still buy everything I write. But 
Um, there, you know, there's just certain personality types like me. I'd rather buy something than join a newsletter list. I think most mm-hmm. authors feel that way. We don't yeah. like getting email, yeah. but a lot of readers, you know, they're willing to sign up, you know, and quickly and easily if they can't buy it somewhere. So I don't know <laughs> that we ever keep everybody happy, but how do you keep them happy while they're waiting? Um, I didn't, I didn't tell them I was taking a break. <laughs> <laughs> I still emailed them every single week. And, um, I just, I was burned out and I needed, you know, a break. I was still doing enough on the fantasy side to have stuff to talk to them about. And I just, just wrote a bunch of Western romances and, um, I've only taken a break from fantasy once to do that, but it was also around the time when I'd had a baby. I mean, I, I have natural life breaks that require me mm-hmm. to stop writing. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, you know what? I just need a break from fantasy in general, but not writing. And yeah. so when you're burned out, like it's, re- it's weird what sorts of things peak interest, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. Weird. And if you are like, I, I used to write cozies all the time and now I'm writing historical and just that switching up and doing something different. It just feels so good. And then going back to the cozy, I'm sure will feel good if I go back, but it's um, like the new challenge to write something different yeah. is um, exciting and interesting to right. me. Keeps me interested. Yeah. 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 Like my bride's books, when I got to the fourth one, I'm like, I'm done with brides. Like there are only so many ways you can run away from a wedding and without <laughs> looking like a complete jerk. And I think I've exhausted them. And I just, I just couldn't write anymore. So I, I wrote this, it's still romantic comedy. It's still, you know, it's basically set. I mean, it's same brand, same everything, but it's just different. It's also written in first person where the others are written in third person. And, but it wasn't three months after I made that big announcement, I came up with two ideas for rides books, you know? And so I'm like, Oh, well, I guess I'll go back at some point. So, but it was just, I needed that break from, you know, runaway brides all the time uh, to kind of have a little fresh perspective. So, yeah. Those brides, they get Those annoying get after a while. Those brides. Brides are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I wanted to talk to you too about working with your spouse because um, you guys um, both work together to bring out your books. So, um, can you talk to us about that and tell us, because a lot of people would really like to retire their husband and um, just tell us how that goes and what your tips are for that. Um, he's really cute. So that helps. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> um, he's, he's, he is a professional illustrator. So the first thing before he even started writing, I mean, he does write now he's co we've co-written a couple books now, but he understood that drive I have to create. And so that's been a huge help in just running the business and allowing me time to write and, um, understanding me. And so that, that was a really big thing. Um, a lot of people are married to people who aren't artists and they're accepting, but they don't fully understand, you know? Mm -hmm. And so me one, yeah, (laughs) me wanting to be a writer, (laughs) he understands that need and I'm cranky if I don't write, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's a huge help. Um, He's done a lot of data science stuff in in his work, in his career. Um, He's a lab technician. Uh, He does coronavirus testing, things like that. And so he understands data science. And so he's been able to help us in that way too. Um, what it basically is, is because he's an artist, I have to give him time to create his art when he needs it. And then he gives me time as well for mine. Um, and then when it comes to like the books that we've co-written, I mean, it's, they're my stories. And so he writes them and then I change what he writes to fit my writing style. And so nobody's been able to tell which parts he's written, which parts he hasn't written because they are my books. Mm -hmm. If we came up with an idea together, um, it would be different. We actually probably wouldn't be different. We would still want them to have the same fill all the way throughout, you know, and because Mm -hmm. I'm married. Oh my goodness, guys, the arguments we have, (laughs) (laughs) I would, I would swear no co-writer argues about the things that spouse co-writers argue about. Oh, you're probably right. You're probably right. Oh my gosh. Cause you have to be so careful because they're your spouse and ab- above and beyond the books, I would rather have a healthy relationship mm-hmm. over a successful book. Right. And so, um, so, so I, I, I have to, I, val- I have to, I don't have to, I do. I value his opinion and mm-hmm. his input and, Um, there's been a couple of times where he didn't understand what my vision was for a book. And, you know, what I've done 
to work around that is I change things and then don't tell him. And that's, that's horrible, right? But it is my book. And I have told him I, yeah. I am in charge of this project and he is 100% okay with it. He's like, I just, I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. he, you know, <laughs> it's my project because I brought him in. I wrote the first three books of this current series without mm -hmm. him completely. And so um, it wasn't until book four, I was like, oh my gosh, we wanted to co-write. Why didn't we have you co-write this series with me? Because right. yeah. the series is based on him. It's his personality. Um, and That's so fun. bringing him into the fourth book was very natural. And, but because I'd written the first three books, I'm like, you know what? I know where it has to go. I know what, where it's come from. And the, I know the background, the back history, even if I explain it to him, it's still not the same as it being his idea as well. Right. And so mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. to make changes. And then, like I said, he's like, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a great system. I love it. Yeah. You kill his darlings and he never knows. And, and you know what? He's, he's not, he's more of the kind of author who writes not necessarily because he loves it, but because it's um, a business. And when it, when it comes to his art, I could never, ever do that with his art. It, we would have been divorced years ago, you know, but with writing, it's not his darling, you know, it's not his baby. It, it is, it is to me, you know, yeah. um, but to him, he's like, well, we got to be efficient. I like writing. You need your books to come out when they're supposed to come out. And so mm -hmm. he helps me. And so he doesn't have that same, um, precious feeling that mm -hmm. I do and that most authors have, you know, right. he does about his art. So like I yeah. said, I have to be careful there, but <laughs> right. that is so interesting. And, and so, and he does it for all your series or just, is there just one? Just this one. Just I mean, one. it's, it was really funny. Uh, we've been married for 10 years almost. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we were on a road trip and I turned to him and I was like, Hey, have you ever considered writing? <laughs> Funny, I never asked him before. Yeah. Um, and apparently he'd had brainstormed three series, complete series, and he hadn't started writing, but I had, it just blew me away. Like that I, he'd never told me and that I'd never asked him and that he actually had ideas for books. Um, and so it just, it blew me away. And his, his series, his ideas are all science fiction, military mm -hmm. stuff. And mm -hmm. you know, he had ideas before that became popular. And, you know, with uh, <laughs> Chris Fox, when he started doing all the science fiction, military stuff, um, yeah. But, but like this fantasy stuff, um, I mean, I didn't bring him in until the last two books he's co-written mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. Um, great. one of them is published. He's written three full books of his own series. I am a co-author on that. They're his ideas. I can't kill anything mm -hmm. without talking to him first, yeah. but those books have not been published yet. Um, we're hoping we'll have time to focus on them later because they're really, really funny stories. He's a natural storyteller. I'm like, dude, you should have been doing this all along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's so great. Well, Andrea, this has been great. So tell us what you think you've done to set yourself up for success. Um, okay. So I, I would say probably establishing a healthy and flourishing newsletter. Mm -hmm. Um, like, not, I mean, having contacts, you know, trying to bring in new subscribers on a regular basis, um, emailing them every single week. That's pretty common now people back, but people back in the day when I first said you should be emailing every week, they're like, ah! <laughs> but now people know that most authors, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Most authors know that a lot of authors email every week. And then I use automation sequences as a way for people to come, um, to know, like, and trust me. And it's really helped my royalties. Um, I would, yeah, but seriously, my success is based on my newsletter list. And when my newsletter list is not doing well, my books generally aren't doing well. Mm -hmm. And of course I need to be releasing regular books too. But to me, regular is three, three times a year, four times a year, sometimes only two times a year, mm -hmm. depending on babies and pregnancies and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so right now I just, you know, I just do my best to focus on making sure my newsletter is healthy and flourishing. That's great. great I think that's that. really smart yes, because right. we're, we're all going to have times when we can't produce like X number of books per year. Mm -hmm. But if you have those relationships established and you have some marketing ideas, then you can get through those times until you can release another book or you can, you know, box something up, you know? So I think that's really smart. Yeah. Always. That always golden. comes up. Yeah. It always comes up. <laughs> I just yeah. want to remind people about that. It always <laughs> comes up. So, very good. so, um, I don't, I, the only place I'm really active right now is actually the podcast. The one that you guys already mentioned, mm -hmm. six figure authors. I'm not active on Facebook currently. I get on there occasionally to get into the six figure author group and, you know, respond to things there and here and there. I am months behind on email. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah got to experience that. <laughs> it was not that long. And you oh, did that's, reply. 
<laughs> that's because I was like, ah, oh, crap, I need to check my email again. <laughs> so like I was checking my email once a week instead of once every couple of weeks. Um, it's, it's just been, I can't keep up with everything right now. And so right. there's certain things that I've had to take off the list completely. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a bunch of marketing courses for authors. If anyone's um, interested, you can find me that way and you can email me on my, the email address that's attached to those marketing courses. And I do respond there pretty quickly. Um, okay. So self published on courses.com. I have courses on automation sequences, Amazon, um, Amazon algorithms, um, getting reviews, finding subscribers, planning big promotions. Uh, let's see what else was there. I can't remember right now. Just go look. Um, but, uh, I have a coupon code. It's colon. <laughs> um, you can get 50% off and we can, we could say is like colon as in semicolon. We'll just say it's as grammar related. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. 50% off my courses and my courses are, they're not, they're like 50 bucks, 25 bucks. I have one that's $5. My goal with them is not to make money is to help teach people. And so when I have clients that I can't do one-on-one -on -one sessions anymore with, um, I say, go take my course instead. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they're not, you know, they're not huge money makers and they're not money makers at all. <laughs> Let's be honest, but they're a great way for people to say, you know, I want to learn how to make it run a big promotion. And then, you know, they can go get my course for 50% off. And like I said, that's at self published Um, you can look me up on my website, Andrea Pearson books.com. Um, you can find me on Facebook, but like I said, I'm never on Facebook. We'll put all that information in the show notes and uh, your courses and where people can find you and stuff. So we just appreciate you being here so much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank and you thank you for your patience. Your good information. <laughs> oh no, we're, it was good. So thanks so much. You can find all the links in the show notes at wish I'd known for writers.com. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, Tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.